Okay, well, uh, we're good to go. So uh, welcome everyone to the 54th episode of the Scriptural Mormonism podcast. I'm your host, Robert Bodlin. Today, we actually have a returning guest, uh, Gregory Dundas. And today we will be uh, given a brief introduction and overview of his book, Mormon's Record, the historical message of the Book of Mormon that just recently came out. Um, in fact, I actually got a copy before you did. So, <laughs> so that's kind of funny. Um, in the show notes, I'll include a link to the uh, book on the Religious Studies Center's website for BYU. And everyone should definitely pick it up. It's a pretty good book on how to read the Book of Mormon as a history. But before we kind of uh, discuss some aspects of the book. Um, Greg, um, thanks again for coming back to the podcast. And how about you just give like a brief introduction about yourself? Like what's your educational background? What's your religious background? And any other previous books or articles you'd like to mention uh, before we discuss this particular one? Sure. Um, so I am a convert to the church. Uh, um, I, I'm originally from San Diego. Uh, I, I joined the church uh, in high school. Actually, a uh, I think a week before I started college. Um, and I then served a mission, uh, a Spanish speaking mission in Montreal, Canada. Um, and when I got back from that, I um, I started after a little bit of delay um, on my part, not quite knowing what I should major in, I finally settled on history and classics, Greek and Roman classics. Um, and I, at the time, I was planning on going to law school, but um, I got so involved in my historical studies that I um, decided to go on and go to graduate school. I got a PhD in Greek and Roman history, primarily Roman history um, at UCLA. Um, um, I, I wrote a dissertation on a subject that has continued to interest me uh, for many, many years um, on the Roman imperial cult, the cult of the emperor, um, specifically in the area of, of Roman Egypt. Um, after that, I didn't have, well, I taught, I taught uh, on, as an adjunct for a couple of years in Southern California, and uh, I had very little luck in breaking into academia on a full-time basis. Um, so I ended up going back to plan A, so to speak, which was to go to law school. I got a JD at University of Michigan. Um, and then of all places, I, I worked for 20 years at the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, uh, which was quite shocking that they even hired me because I had no business background whatsoever, but life can be pretty strange sometimes. And um, all that time, I, I had the hope and the dream of retiring, uh, hopefully a few years ahead of schedule and working, you know, writing, essentially writing on things that really interested me. So I kept up on my skills as best I could while I was working full time in my languages. Um, and I was fortunate in 2016, getting an article published in BYU Studies, which was entitled Explaining Mormonism. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm ahead of myself. The article was named um, Kingship and Democracy and the Message of the Book of Mormon. And then um, in 2022, uh, my first book came out, which was entitled Explaining Mormonism. A Believing Skeptic's Guide to the Latter-day Saint Worldview. Um, and I guess I would say that my, my orientation through all this, my intellectual orientation, uh, has always been historically oriented. Um, and specifically in terms of cultural and intellectual history, social history broadly construed, um, and um, particularly in, in the ancient world, of course, um, and, and especially the idea of what I call worldviews or mentalities, meaning um, trying to look at societies and civilizations in terms of how they looked at the world um, so that, you know, studying 
um, ancient religions or whatever it might be, le focusing less on specific doctrines or practices or things like that, but trying to understand what those ideas or attitudes of, of people that uh, that that engaged in those practices, um, th their unspoken assumptions about how the world functions, basically. Um, and I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm still not sure to this day that if I'd stayed in academia, I ever would have been a a great success. I by by nature, I'm not a special specialist, uh, um, which is kind of the nature of of academic study. Um, I'm very oriented toward synthesis rather than um, you know breaking things apart, um, and. Um, you know, I understand the need for specialization, but at the same time, I feel like there's a crying need um, in academia for people to come along and try to tie things together and, and synthesize what we know. Um, and the tendency tends is very much toward, you know, silo, what in business they call siloing things into little tiny silos and pretty much sticking with that, you know, and um, I, I find that, that problematic. Okay, well, that, I think that's a, a good introduction. So as I said, like uh, we'll be discussing briefly uh, some aspects of your book, Mormon's Record. Um, so maybe like the first question I should ask you is like, why did you write this book? You know, why do you think there was a pressing need to write a book like this um, for the Laherty scene audience? So what caused you to write it and what do you think... What need do you think you were filling in by writing this book? Well, um, as I say, I, I felt like, you know, my, my own disposition is toward history. Um, and I, I enjoy doctrine, obviously, and theology and things like that. Um, but I have, I've had the feeling for years that, that in the church, we tend to uh, focus a lot on the Book of Mormon in particular, but you know, scriptures in general, um, but particularly the Book of Mormon as almost as if it's a work of theology, as though Mormons set out to write a work of theology and doctrine. Um, and I, I just think that that's not at all the case. Um, um, you know, he, he, he wrote a history and that's, 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 what, that's what the Book of Mormon is. And of course, it's filled with doctrinal um, ideas and principles, and and important uh, important theological principles and important doctrines uh, about Christ and the atonement, and all those things are extremely important. And yet, as a genre, the Book of Mormon is quite clearly on its surface a history of the, the people of the Nephites. Um, and um, you know, so that was that was one thing that 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 I felt was was important to go into. Um, the, if I can just back up chronologically, the the germ of of the book really goes back to a um, number of years ago when I was teaching gospel doctrine on a regular basis, um, and I started noticing the the constant recurrence of the word contention in Nephite society and um, began to think about that and, and realize that it was really a major theme that, uh, that Mormon was using um, uh, to structure his, 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 his history. Um, and again, the Kind of a growing awareness, I would say that that Mormon had a central message that the Book of Mormon was not just kind of a ragbag collection, so to speak, of 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 facts of, of historical details or something like that, but it was a fairly carefully structured story um, that that culminated in the the fall of the Nephites, right? And um, 
I'm sure that all readers are aware of that to some extent, but to my mind, it's been not been emphasized um, in all the years of of, uh, of discussion and scholarship on the Book of Mormon. Um, so that was kind of that was kind of where it started was this idea of contention, and then I began thinking about it for a number of a number of years, just kind of in the back of my mind, and. Um, you know, it finally dawned on me that that was probably the the major um, impetus, if you will, for Mormon to write the book at all. You know, at the very end, I think it's in Mormon eight, chapter eight. He he talks about he 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 phrases that question actually, where he says, "Oh, ye fair ones, how could you have fallen? Um, how is this possible?" You know, he's he's obviously seeing this terrible destruction uh, going on around him uh, and he's directly involved in it. And, um, you know, he poses the question to himself, to the reader, to, to his people, how is it that you could have fallen? How could you have rejected Jesus Christ um, after all the, you know, after all the, 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 the blessings uh, of, of knowledge that they had received? Um, and, you know, we, we tend, I think it's fairly natural that we tend to focus on, on positive and uplifting aspects in the Book of Mormon. I think that's totally natural. Um, and we focus on doctrinal issues, which are, um, you know, important and, and, and lifestyle principles on how we're expected to live as, 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 uh, disciples of Christ and so on. But um, in fact, <laughs> when you when you look at the Book of Mormon as a whole, and I, I, I'm going to add that when, I, when I'm talking about the Book of Mormon, I'm really talking about Mormon's book or Mormon's record, not the, not the little Book of Mormon at the end, but, but the, the whole book that Mormon wrote, which of course we don't have all of, we're missing the first 116 pages or whatever. Um, and um, but that's what I mean by Mormon's record is basically everything in the Book of Mormon, except the small plates, which I touch on only very, very briefly, and the the Book of Moroni at the end. Um, so that's that's Mormon's record, um, and I, I began noticing that Mormon quite deliberately skips over most of the happy times, the times of peace. You know, um, and in in Alma 50, for example, he mentions that there never was a happier time among the Nephites, you know, in this time of peace, which is which is odd in itself, because it's right in the middle of the Great War um, that's being fought by Captain Moroni. He says there never was a happier time, um, even though at that moment, you know, it's, it's a time of peace, but um, it's still. But then he never goes on and tells us about that time of peace, you know, what were they doing? How, how did they live their lives? Uh, and so on. He tells us nothing at all. Um, same thing with fourth Nephi. Um, you know, here we have these nearly two centuries <clears throat> following the visit of Jesus Christ to the Americas, um, what we call a Zion-like society, and yet he tells us almost nothing at all about what was going on, right? Except, and, and I want to point this out very specifically, because it, it just, when it struck me, it, was, it just really, it really struck me um, at how much he emphasizes when he's describing the society, he's not talking again about, you know, he says things like, uh, they had all things in common. Okay, that's that's very interesting. Um, and he says, uh, you know, a couple of other things. They were married and given in marriage. Okay. Um, but, you know, again, what was it really like to live in such a society? He tells us virtually nothing at all. What he does tell us or what he does emphasize again and again is the lack of contention. <clears throat> 
right? He says, and, and when you read it, I didn't notice this many, many times until I started paying attention to this idea of contention. Uh, you know, he says there was no contention and disputations among them. That's in verse two. Um, in verse four, he says there continued to be peace in the land. Um, and, uh, and then he goes on and on repeating this, just emphasizing this again and again. There was no contention among all the people in verse 13. Verse 15, there was no contention in the land. There were no envyings or strifes or tumults nor mur murders. Um, there were no robbers. Uh, there were no ites in that famous phrase, you know, um, obviously meaning that there were no, these typical social divisions that they had or political divisions possibly um, were no longer in existence. 18, there was no contention in all the land. He just keeps hammering at this. That Obviously that is what is uppermost in his mind that that there was a lack of contention, right? And and when you take that into it, put it in its historical context, um, as I did, I say over a period of years, I started noticing just how prominent this idea of contention was, um, and uh, so I thought that you know that really deserves uh, more emphasis than we usually give it. So, you know, when, when, and, and people always ask, well, why is there so much about war in the Book of Mormon? And there have been a few attempts to try to explain that, but I don't think there's never been a real complete, um, thorough explanation of what, what Mormon was doing when he, he included all this war. Some people say, well, he was a general, so he was interested in war, or, you know, war was a, endemic to ancient civilization. So of course he had to, but, but it's, it's got to be more than that. It's got to be way more than that. Um, so one of the things I noticed was, <clears throat> um, you know, we talk a lot about pride uh, with regard to the Book of Mormon, the pride cycle and so on. Um, and it turns out that the word pride occurs 54 times in Mormon's record, also in the rest of the Book of Mormon, but in Mormon's record, it occurs 54 times. The word contention and contend occur 125 times, which is two and a half as many times um, as the word pride. Um, and I also came across a statistic that um, out of 239 total chapters in the Book of Mormon, 174 of them deal with these unpleasant subjects, shall we say, of contention, war, um, assassination, um, you know, conspiracies, and so on and so forth. So the question arose in my mind, I think it's a fairly natural question, why didn't Mormon include you know, more about the happy times. Why did he put all of this depressing content into his book? Um, was he simply, you know, trying to write a more exciting story to hold people's attention? I think that's obviously not, not his main motive. Um, and I love this quotation that I found of Hugh Nibley, where he says, um, for some reason, he says, for some reason there has been chosen for our attention a story of how and why two previous civilizations on this continent were utterly destroyed. Um, why? You know, why? Why is this so important? Um, Mormon obviously thought it was important to include uh, not only the story of the fall of his people, the Nephites, which you know, you might say, well, it, it, he's just telling the story of his people, and that's what happened. Um, but he also makes it clear that he thought the story of the Jaredites was important. Um, and of course, he doesn't quite get around to that. And so Moroni has to jump in and, 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 and write the story of the Book of Ether. Um, 
but it's clearly not just the story of 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 his people, the Nephites. Whatever happened, happened. Kind of a random telling. Um, but it, he was he was clearly emphasizing this idea that he wanted us to see the pattern of the fall of the uh, of both the Nephites and the the Jaredites. So. Again, you know, we tend to emphasize kind of the uplifting aspects of the Book of Mormon and the story of the heroes and the, you know, the Almas and the Moronis and the Helamans and so on. Um, but Mormon is emphasizing something quite different, which is the these depressing, you know, aspects of of of, of these people um, and. Um, I, I just thought that, that that needed more emphasis. Okay, uh, that, I think that's a good overview as to like why you wrote the book. So thanks for that. Um, before we kind of delve into like maybe some brief aspects of it, um, in the introduction, like viewing Mormon's record, one of the topics you deal with, like say, is actually is the Book of Mormon actually a historical text that seemed to take place in space and time. Um, so for you, you know, uh, and the thesis of this book, how important is not just that the Book of Mormon like reads as history, but that it actually tells faithfully more or less like what took place. Like it's not a fictional text. It's not parabolic. It's actually historical, uh, which is the traditional view. So if you want to like briefly touch upon that briefly. So the historicity of the, of the book. Um, I mean, I think that's an important question. Um, but it's not one that I really deal with in this book. Um, I think there's a lot of content in the book that that could be used uh, to, to make that argument. And maybe I'll get into that in a, in a few minutes. But um, my focus is really on not the historicity of the Book of Mormon, but the, but the Book of Mormon as historiography. Right. So, you know, and, and again, and this is something that. that it's always kind of perplexed to me that that we don't talk more about that. Not that people are trained historians necessarily, but but just you know, the, there's there's been a lot of discussion over the years about the Book of Mormon as a work of literature, you know, and literary devices that are used um, in the book, which is all fine and good. I'm certainly not objecting to that, but you know, we have here we have this work of history. And again, it's not a question of history as being true or not. It's a work of historiography, which is, you know, I mean, I believe it's true. I believe it's true history, but theoretically, you could say that it's just a story written as history. But I, I you know, that that's a question I really put aside for the most part. The question is that you have this work that is written as a history, um, and he presents his subject. Uh, the Nephites, basically, um, as as a story with certain themes and certain emphasis. He's shaping his story in in certain ways, um, and yet and yet we don't talk about that, right? I mean, we present it again as a book of uh, of theology and doctrine on the one hand, or a work of literature on the other, and all this technical discussion of you know poetics and rhetoric or whatever. Um, all of which is great, but you know, there's never been much work done on 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 the work as a work of historiography of of something that an actual historian, you know, wanted how he wanted to communicate the story of the Nephites, um, and I thought that you know that, again that was something that should be emphasized. Um, And, um, you know, um, so another, another aspect of that, that I, I thought was important was, um, when I started reading into a lot of the research that's been done on the Book of Mormon, there seemed to be a strong tendency toward, um, looking at Mormon as not a historian, not as an author of, of his record, 
but just as a compiler, as an editor, or as an abridger, and those terms in, in a lot of Book of Mormon writings um, come up frequently, you know, that that Mormon is Mormon is basically just kind of gluing together, if you will, writings that, that already existed um, before he came along. Um, and I've never read the Book of Mormon that way. You know, to me, he's clearly writing the Book of, Mor Book of Mormon, meaning Mormon's record, is a work that is written by Mormon. And it's clear that he, that he um, quotes a lot of his sources at length um, sometimes. Um, but when he's not quoting his sources, he's writing. He's not, he's not simply taking something that already pre-existed and just kind of cutting out, you know, bridging it, cutting out some details here and there, and then doing it all together. This is a book that is written, again, as a history of the Nephites from someone who lived in Mormon's time, in at, at the end of their civilization. And it's it's written from his perspective. It's written from uh, uh, with his own language. Um, and he's showing, he's, he's telling us what he sees has happened over the period of many, many centuries from his vantage point. And I think that's an important distinction um, that this is really Mormon's record. It's not just, you know, uh, an abridgment of, of stuff that preexisted him. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons that, that we do this, I think, um, that we kind of de-emphasize Mormon's role in this whole thing is, I think there's several different reasons, but one is that when, when <laughs> you know, we typically read the Book of Mormon, of course, from beginning to end, and the first 116 pages or whatever it is are the small plates, right? And the, the small plates are clearly not written as a history. They're, they're, they're written um, as, as Nephi says, when he started writing the second set of plates, it was written, I mean, it was designed specifically to, um, to focus on spiritual matters, on prophecy, on revelations, and so on. And it's fairly random. You know, once you get once you get beyond the beginning story of the of the people of Lehi that that escaped from Jerusalem, um, a lot of it is fairly random stuff. Just you know, a prophecy here, a vision there, and uh, uh, you know, preaching and so on. Um, there's not much continuity continuity to it or continuous uh, discourse, and so. There's um, there's there there's a specific example of a well-known Book of Mormon scholar. I won't bother naming him at this point, um, but he says he makes specifically makes the point that the Book of Mormon was not intended as a history, and then he gives several citations to support this statement, and all of the statements, all of the citations he gives are from the small plates from actually the words of Nephi. And we know that, in fact, Nephi said specifically that the large plates, which were the main source that Mormon used for his record, were um, intended as a history, right? He says the, these were for the more historical parts of, 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 the, of the story. <clears throat> And of course, there's still a lot of spiritual content. There's still a lot of preaching and prophecy and so on. Um, but he's he's using these he's using these 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 large plates as we call them today, um, which was supposed to contain the history of the kings and their wars and their contentions, and that was the whole point. And yet, my point is that when we you know when we read the Book of Mormon from cover to cover. We look at the small plates, and that sort of sets the tone for reading the rest of it. And so we, you know, we kind of forget that, in fact, there's this huge gap between the content of the small plates 
and Mormon's record, which was based primarily on the large plates. Yeah, th thanks for that. Um, I kind of noticed like whenever people say the Book of Mormon is not meant to be read as history, usually like doctrine or devotion, they kind of focus on like say one Nephi onwards, not Mormon's actual work. Um, right. Okay, so uh, the book is actually split into like three parts, and like maybe if you were to like give a brief overview of these parts just to whet people's appetite. Uh, the first is the ancient sacral worldview. Um, so maybe if you were to like briefly discuss what that is, and then we can go into like say uh, sacral historiography afterwards. Okay, so I really kind of need to explain this backwards for it to make sense. Um, so there is a lot of content in the first two sections of the book, first two parts that only touch uh, briefly on the Book of Mormon itself. And the reason that I wrote it that way is that I felt it was necessary not only to talk about Mormon himself as a historian and the content of the historical content of his record, but to try to put it in a broader context um, and a uh, broader historical, ancient historical context. So, um, you know, I think, again, one of the reasons that, that people sort of de-emphasize the historical aspect of, of the Book of Mormon or of Mormon's record is that um, people who are not, you know, trained historians tend to think of, um, of a history in modern terms. So... Um, you know, a historic uh, a work of history is supposed to be objective. It's supposed to talk about uh, politics and social trends and social, you know, causation. Um, what 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 caused the 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 what brought about the 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 end of slavery or what brought about the the rise of World War One or whatever it might be. Um, and it's supposed to be done in objective. Um, terms, almost semi-scientific terms, right? Uh, and, and so people say, well, Mormon, like the historical writers in the Old Testament, we're really just writing a, a work of theology. It's not really history. It's, it's, it's mostly theology with a little historical, you know, details thrown in. Um, and so I felt that there was a need to to really go back and explain for non-historians what history is. Um, and so part two, I'm gonna skip over part one for the moment. Part two is really kind of a discussion to, ex to show how historiography over the centuries, there's a huge division between modern historiography, which begins roughly around 1850, middle of the 19th century, and everything that went before, basically. I'm speaking in broad generalities, of course. But um, modern historiography um, focuses on what I just said a moment ago. You know, it's kind of on this objective, very scientific or at least highly analytical look at, at documentary sources um, and things like that. Um, before that, those kinds of things were simply not uppermost in the mind of a historian, of any historian. Um, and so again, I'm talking about from the very beginning of, of, of written history, from in the ancient Near East through the Greeks and Romans, the Jews, uh, even into the medieval period, um, and even into the early modern period with people like Voltaire, for example. Uh, Voltaire was interested not in scientific history in any sense, but he was interested in, in history that, that addressed, broadly speaking, addressed moral questions and cultural questions um, and uh, he basically said, most of history is kind of worthless. We don't even need to know that stuff. It's just certain aspects of, of the past that are really essential. Anyway, <clears throat> um, 
So this, you know, I, I, I discuss, I try to do it very, very, um, without going into too much detail, but, but, but I try to explain that the role of a historian, um, even in the modern world, for example, you know, the, the role of a historian is not just names and dates and facts and things like that, but the a historian is supposed to actually um, interpret um, his documents or his sources. And um, he's supposed to, as I say, address causation. Um, it's not, you know, history is not factual. It should be based on facts, but it is also a creative process. Um, and uh, as I said just a moment ago, the, there's a great emphasis in pre-modern history, that is everything before the middle of the 19th century, on the idea that history is supposed to be, um, at least one of its major roles, is to provide uh, moral instruction. So if anybody criticizes Mormon for being a moralist rather than a historian, it's like, well, you're ignoring thousands of years of historiography. The Romans, for example, the ancient Romans that wrote history, that was one of their major concerns was they boiled everything down to moral questions. Um, the Greeks did the same to a great extent. Um, and of course, the Old Testament writers did the same and Mormon does the same, you know. So Mormon very much fits into what I call the, the, the archaic mentality and especially the archaic sacral mentality. mentality. Um, so Mormon wrote what I call sacral history or sacral historiography, if you prefer. Um, and, um, you know, what does that mean? So some people have said, well, it's not history, it's sacred history. Okay, well, what does that mean? You know, uh, does it just mean that it's history with a few mentions of deity thrown in? Or what is it exactly? And um, my, my take on this is that that sacral history is an attempt to explain history, you know, explain human events, human civilization in in sacral terms, in sacred terms. And again, that that's that's not just kind of a, a throwaway term, uh, that it has something to do with religion. Sacral, the idea of sacrality is something that is pervasive in ancient society. And so then, you know, backing up, going against the against the the grain in in my book, before discussing the idea of sacral history, I go back and talk about the sacral worldview of of the ancients. And you know, this some of the ideas in there come from Unibli, they come from Mircea Eliada for those. Uh, viewers who are, are familiar with his work. He was one of the great religion scholars in, uh, in the 20th century. Um, and this whole idea of, of the sacred as being fundamental to um, ancient civilization. And again, this is, we have to distinguish between the modern world, which in this case goes pretty much back to the scientific revolution in the 16th and, and early 17th centuries. Um, with people like uh, Galileo and Descartes and uh, Hobbes and and then especially um, Isaac Newton in the in, in the 17th century, um, and they there was this huge transformation in worldview um, in Western civilization, uh, beginning with Newton, you know. Newton was the culmination of this trend. And then after Newton, it was completely different. So what we have is um, a world, a modern world in which the world, the natural world, everything around us is viewed in purely objective scientific terms. 
um, and mechanical terms, really, right? So the this this new idea that that comes across in Newton and Newton, by the way, was was a very religious man. And he was very interested in the Bible and even in the Book of Revelation, but his work, his scientific work, left this strong impression that the world was basically a big machine, um, and um, you know, God may have created the world, but then he just pressed the button on the machine and it goes on its own according to natural law. The archaic world, everything before Newton, more or less, um, was just the opposite, right? So it's, the world is not mechanical at all. And it's not, it's not meaningless. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not just a, a physical thing that's there that runs on its own the the the, the pre-modern view of the world was that the world was uh, run by deity by god or in the case of polytheistic societies um the gods and um so you know, I, I discussed this at some length um, because I think it's it's important to understand this this very foreign worldview that Mormon fits into, and yet it's very foreign to to the to us, right? So, in, in order to understand what Mormon is really doing, what he's as a historian, as a sacral historian, if you will, um, it's necessary to understand. What sac what the sacral world mentality actually was, um, and 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 uh, you know see him in that context. I can go on if you want me to discuss yeah, it in further yeah, detail. Yeah, yeah, if you want to like uh, maybe like flesh out like sacral you know general sacral history and sacral historiography and like um, how that helps like interpret the Book of Mormon as history and so forth, if you wish. Okay, so um, you know some some people may be familiar with um, an article that Hugh Nibley wrote way 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 back in the mid twentieth century um, that's called the Heliocentric State, and it's in the it's in the Farms um, volume called the Ancient State, I believe. Um, and I, I love this word. He didn't invent it, but. We borrowed it from someone else, but it, but it, I love the term that he uses, the hero-centric, because um, it obviously has to do with centrality, centric. Hero in Greek means sacred. So the word hero-centric implies then that the sacred is central to the world. Again, not just you know to somebody's religion, this religion or that religion or the other, but in the in the inherent nature of the world around us the sacred is is central um and um the gods permeate reality gods or god i'll use them interchangeably at this point um uh you know the god the, there's meaning and significance in what happens um and again that's you know that's something that we're missing in the modern world there's this feeling like Due to this mechanistic idea of of, of reality, um, dating back to the scientific revolution, there's this overwhelming feeling that that there's the world is meaningless, right? The only meaning, um, uh, according to the existentialists, if, is what we contribute ourselves, what we make up, basically. Um, but in the in antiquity, it was very much it was very very different. It was, um, you know, they saw the gods. As, as central to everything that happened. And um, the, the, um, the Egyptians, for example, had this concept called Mat, um, which was a very broad concept that had to do with truth and order and um, reality, justice. All these fundamental concepts were given to the Egyptians, to the world, by the gods, uh, it was the fundamental order of the cosmos, um, and they kings 
were 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 essential. So most people are aware that Egyptian kings, pharaohs, were considered deities, but they weren't quite deities in the in the ultimate sense because they were still mortal. Everybody knew that they were mortal, but um, but when there was a king, you know, during the reign of a king, the king was responsible for establishing mat um, and making sure that the divine order of the world was maintained and sustained. Um, uh, and when the king died, there was that brief little interregnum between between one king and another king, which in ideological or theological terms was a period of chaos, right? There was no king to maintain order. Therefore, everything was topsy-turvy. Everything was a mess until the new king was installed. Um, and so the king was central. The idea of sacral kingship, which is, again, goes back to my dissertation, and it's just something that's fascinated me from the first time I read uh, Hugh Nibley's article on this. The, the idea of the sacral kingship, so the king is central, again, between God and man. And um, he, is, he is expected to maintain order. He represents human beings before the gods. He's the one that's always depicted in, on the walls of temples as sacrificing to the gods. It's not just somebody. It's always the king. But he also associates with, with the gods and represents the gods to the rest of the people. So he's like a god on earth, but he's also, you know, the one that sacrifices to the god. So he has this kind of um, in-between relationship. Um, the Egyptians always referred to the king as a god, even though, as I say, he wasn't really quite a god. But the, the sacral mentality, the way they expressed themselves was through myth, through metaphor, through symbols um, that are not meant to be taken literally. So I have in the book I have this depiction, this this from from an Egyptian uh, uh, depiction of the goddess Nut, N U T, um, who represented the sky. She was the sky goddess, uh, and she was often depicted as a cow. Right. So they show this big cow stretched across the earth underneath um and there's some other stuff going on um but you know the sky the, the cow is the sky is depicted as a cow now nobody i guarantee that nobody in ancient egypt actually looked up at the sky and said there's a big cow up there you just can't see her but she, that's, the sky is actually a cow nobody nobody thought in those literalistic terms the cow obviously was a metaphor or a symbol for something probably having to do with fertility of the sky and the rain and so on. Um, but that's just one, one example of how the sacral milieu, the sacral worldview um, relied in great part on uh, symbols and metaphors. Um, and so the idea of center, going back to the idea of the sacred center um, is uh Again, not it's not a question of the geographical center of Egypt or of the world or of anything else. It was that those concepts and those real those sacred realities were central to human existence, to the universe. Um, and I, I, I thought I would just read this this um, brief um, Quotation from the Jewish Midrash. Um, the, that that I think explains this idea of centrality better than anything else. So it says, it says, just as the navel is found at the center of a human being, so the land of Israel is found at the center of the world. And it is the foundation of the world, and, and it is the foundation of the world. Jerusalem is at the center of the land of Israel. The temple is at the center of Jerusalem. The Holy of Holies is at the center of the temple. The Ark is at the center of the Holy of Holies, and the foundation stone is in front of the Ark, which point is the foundation of the world. 
Okay, so it describes this concept of centrality in terms of concentric circles of, you know, it says the the land of Israel is at the center of the world, of the whole world. Jerusalem is at the center of Israel. The temple is at the center of Jerusalem. The Holy of Holies is at the center of the temple. And the Ark of the Covenant is at the center of the Holy of Holies. So it's, you know, the Ark of the Covenant is the most central and the most sacred thing of all. And it also has to do, it says, with the foundation of the world, with the creation. So that, I think, gives a, a sense of, of what this is all about, you know, that, that, that the sacred is, again, conceptually, not geographically, but conceptually at the center of our existence. And the idea of a moral order in the, in, in the universe, in the cosmos, uh, is fundamental to the ancient mentality. And so these kinds of ideas, I believe, are central to what Mormon is doing in writing his record. Um, and of course, he doesn't talk in those terms. He's not a, he's not a religion scholar. He's not, he's not Eliada. Um, uh, these are things that we have to draw out of, of our sources. But I believe that they are that there are indications that there are really that these ideas are are really fundamental. This not necessarily of of the center, the idea of the center itself, but um, the idea of of there being a moral moral order in the world. I think that kind of goes without without explanation. Uh, the idea of the sacral kingship is um, is important in in Mormon's record. Um, so as I said a few minutes ago, the king was considered to have direct responsibility over the people, over the civilization. So in the Old Testament, it says repeatedly when it's going through, you know, in, in, in Samuel and Kings, when it's going through the um, the wicked, you know, especially the wicked kings. Um, and it says over and over again that the king cause the people to sin. Um, it's not the people. So the people themselves are not fully responsible anyway, maybe partly responsible. But the king bears the primary responsibility when the people sin. Um, and this is, this is totally clear in uh, Mosiah 29. So Mosiah 29 is where King Mosiah um, introduces this new program, this new government uh, of the judgeship. And he says, we're no longer going to have kings, we're going to have judges. Um, and, you know, if you imagine yourself in that situation, this would be a pretty big shock, um, especially for the Nephites, because if you think about, you know, going all the way back to Nephi himself, people begged him to be king. They didn't want anything else, they wanted a king. And they always wanted kings because that was the normal, that was the norm in the ancient world. Um, you know, if you remember in the book of Judges, the, the Israelites begged Samuel for a king. We need a king to fight our battles. We, we can't do it ourselves. Um, and so on. And so in Mosiah, you know, where he, he specifically describes this idea of the sacral kingship and the, the duty and the responsibility of the, of the sacral king. Um, where he says, um, this is Mosiah 29, 31. He says, for behold, I say unto you, the sins of many people have been caused by the iniquities of their kings. Therefore, their iniquities are answered upon the heads of their kings. Okay. And then um, he says, this should not be the case anymore. I desire that this land be a land of liberty and every man may enjoy his rights and privileges alike um, and so on. And he says, in verse 34, he says, he told them that these things ought not to be, but that the, the burden should come upon all the people that every man might bear his part. And the people, the Nephites, clearly understand what he's talking about, this 
the context, the religious context of this of, of this statement of, of their king. And he says they in verse 38 it says, therefore they relinquished their desires for a king, which again was very powerful, um, and they became exceedingly anxious that every man should have an equal chance throughout all the land, yea, and every man expressed a willingness to answer for his own sin. Okay, so this this is a perfect description of the idea of the role of the sacral king in this in the sacral society. Um, and then there's one other concept that, that I think is, 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 is quite um, interesting, which we find in the Book of Mormon, um, which is the idea that nature itself is affected by human sin. Okay, so um, there is, and this is very common in ancient sacral thinking, that, again, nature is not this thing over there that we just kind of happen to, to live in the middle of, this, this, this elemental, objective, mechanistic world that we just happen to be part of, but we're not really a part of it. Um, um, rather, there is... The, the the natural world is we're all connected through these sacral relationships i guess um and um so so when when human beings sin when they violate god's law or where they where they violate the pr principle of mat in egypt or something like that um the world suffers the world suffers as a result of the behavior the immoral behavior of mankind. Nature is directly affected by the moral decisions of us, of the people. So let me let me just convince you <laughs> um, by um, reading. This, this is in the Old Testament. Okay, so this comes from uh, Hosea, Prophet Hosea. Um, so he talks about uh, the Lord has made an indictment against the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or loyalty and no knowledge of God in the land, swearing, lying, and murder, and stealing, and adultery. Bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore, he says, the land mourns. The land mourns. Okay? This is not just a, you know, just a figure of speech. This is, this is the way they conceived of it. The land mourns as a result of all this lying and murder and bloodshed, and all who live in it languish, together with the wild animals and the birds of the air. Even the fish of the sea are perishing as a result of sin. Um, Isaiah has the same thing. He says, the earth lies polluted. He says, the earth dries up and withers. The world languishes and withers. The heavens languish together with the earth. The earth lies polluted under its inhabitants, for they have transgressed the laws, violated the statutes, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse devours the earth, and its inhabitants suffer for their guilt. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth dwindled, and few people are left. Okay, so this is this is something again that's very foreign to our modern way of thinking. Um, it's really hard to you kind of have to work at it to, to understand what in the world, you know, how could they conceive of such a thing that that uh, that that we're that much connected to the world around us, the physical world around us. Um, but in the Book of Mormon, if you think about it, you know, whenever they talk about the the the, the prospering, you know, wait. wait, wait if you follow God's commandments, you will prosper and so on if you're righteous, but it's always prospering in the land. The land is fundamental. Uh, it's not just prospering as a human society, but you will prosper on the land. And um, think about the, the great destructions at the time of Christ, for example. Um, there's a strong emphasis uh, about curses on the land and the massive destruction on the land uh, that comes not just because God is trying to kill people, you know, the sinners, the the, the wicked, um, but because the land itself is suffering under this terrible wickedness that is present in the land. 
And the same thing is true with the Jaredites. How did they, how did the Nephites refer to the land of the Jaredites usually? It was the land of desolation, right? And it was desolate not only of people, but to a certain extent anyway, it was desolate of animals and plants as well. So we have this idea of Eurocentrism, right? Of the sac of, of, of the sacred. And again, this is, you know, I'm not trying to argue that every ancient civilization believed exactly the same thing. They didn't. But they did have these common assumptions uh, about the nature of reality, the nature of the cosmos, that may have had many in, you know individual differences from between the Greeks and the Romans and the Egyptians and the Babylonians and and so on had very different in many ways they were very different um, uh, beliefs uh, theologies if you will um, but they still had these common assumptions that are totally foreign to the modern way of thinking um, So war, for example, and we get back to, you know, there's a lot of wars in the Old Testament histories. There's a lot of wars discussed in, in, in Mormon's record. Um, but um, William Hamblin, some of you may remember William Hamblin, who died far too young, um, was a religion professor at BYU. Um, he, 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 he was quite a, a military scholar um, and he talks about the sacral idea of war in the ancient world. He says, war was the means by which the gods restored cosmic order through organized violence undertaken in their name by their divinely ordained kings. So war in the sacral mentality, war is not just war. It's not just getting out there and killing people. Um, and it's not just politi you know, political domination, although that was, that was clearly you know, an important part of it, but there was also this sacral uh, awareness underlying it, or belief, if you will, that war was a way, you might think of war as, as a form of disorder, but according to the Assyrians and some other peoples back then, war was a way of establishing cosmic order by, because, you know, the, the, the Assyrians were the people that that the gods loved, and uh, because they they were expected to um, dominate the world um, through you know and their gods were supposed to be dominating in the world, and so they were establishing by by dominating these other peoples, these neighboring peoples that didn't believe correctly, they were establishing a kind of cosmic order, mot if you will, um, uh, through through this uh, system of, of warfare. Um, and then we get to the idea of, of um, well, I, 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 I discuss the idea of sacral, um, sacral history. So sacral history is basically, just as myth is an attempt to explain the sacral nature of, mostly of the creation of the period, what we can call time before time. Time before time actually was, was created. So the time of the creation, um, the, 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 the role of the gods, is basically what constitutes myth. It's, it's a lot more complicated than that, obviously, but but simplifying it and then contrasting it with sacral history or historiography is the idea that that um, that uh, trying to explain the sacral order of the world in historical times, which is post creation, um, so, you know, on the real time, time, time around us that we that we live in. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on warfare in ancient historiography, and that 
again, I'm not saying that that's the only reason that they wrote about wars, but that was this, this sacral idea was fundamental to why they thought kings and wars were important. Um, because the kings represented the gods and warfare represented the activity of the gods. Um, excuse me. Um, you get this in the, in the Old Testament. Um, uh, so that there's, you know, a, a lot of, um, in the Pentateuch especially, you know, and obviously there are, there are sacral wars occurring right and left. Um, uh, and it's often depicted as, not so much as God um, fighting the battles of the Israelites, but rather the Israelites are helping God in his battles you know, so it was it was fundamentally sacral and religious, not just war for the sake of war. Um, you get in um, um, well, there's there's a lot that I could go into. I don't want to uh, overwhelm people, but um, the the idea again the 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 basic idea of historiography. Um, as I said earlier, is is this moral idea, right? That um, that history, historiography, was intended to create uh, or to present moral examples to the readers, and you get this a lot in Greek and Roman um, writings. Herodotus, who was the first, called the father of history at least the father of Western history, Greek and Roman history, and, and later Western history. Um, um, and, uh, and obviously, you know, the Greeks and the Romans did not directly affect um, Mormon in any way, or the Nephites, because they wrote long after the, uh, long after Nephi had left, had left the, the Holy Land. Um, so there was no direct correlation, but still, I thought, I think it's an important, Parallel. It's kind of a, a pattern, if you will, that um, that we see in the ancient world, and even in the Greeks and Romans, which are most historians in the 20th century, at least, and even in the 21st century, um, tend to see the Greek and Roman historians as much more secular compared to Old Testament uh, historical writings. Um, and so some people argue that Herodotus was an entirely secular historian, um, which is simply not true. Um, you know, he talks about the gods, but one of the ways, one of the ways in which I analyze this idea of sacral historiography is that, um, the idea of dual causation. Okay. So dual causation means that things are caused both by human beings and by the gods. And, you know, this doesn't necessarily make a whole lot of precise logical sense, um, but they, they nonetheless did that. Um, so um, in Herodotus, for example, who wrote about the, the attack of the Persians on Greece in the fifth century, um, um, there's some very interesting parallels with Mormon's writing, even though, again, there was no direct connection between them. But I think this was all kind of part of the, of the ancient mentality. Uh, there were ideas that were very common, for example, the idea of pride. Uh, in, in, you know, in, in the Old Testament, it refers to pride comes before the fall. Uh, that's very much a theme of Herodotus. Um, and he talks about King Xerxes of Persia invading Greece, uh, and he was punished when he tried to cross from Asia into Europe, um, and a storm destroyed the bridge that he had built. Um, and King Xerxes, in his arrogance against the gods, orders the sea, where this he had built this bridge that was destroyed by a storm, he orders the sea then to be lashed with a whip 300 times. Um, and Herodotus presents this as an act of hubris, right, uh, of violent uh, violent uh, rejection of the gods, kind of a rebellion against the gods. Um, um, 
and even in Thucydides, who is a much more secular historian even than Herodotus, yet these, these moralistic ideas are clearly still there if you read carefully. And, um, you know, the only thing that's, a lot of his language in, in, in his book three, where he's talking about this, this civil conflict um, among uh, this people known as the Corsairians, um, but he says the same kinds of the same kinds of civil conflicts were taking place all over uh, Greece during the Peloponnesian War, um, and a lot of his language sounds an awful lot like Mormon um, Mormons moralizing about you know the behavior of the people that is causing their their destruction. The only thing that's missing in Thucydides is he doesn't say, and thus we see that X, Y, and Z. But he basically says that without using those words. Any comments, Robert? Oh, no, that's pretty good. Um, so when it comes to, say, sacral history and sacral uh, historiography, you kind of touched upon it already, but like, are there any as uh, final aspects of that that you want to like briefly touch upon, like how it can be transposed to like the Book of Mormon as history that may be lost in like say normal readers, if you will, who don't actually have the background, like say historiography and sacral history. You mentioned like you've mentioned already warfare, but like is there any other um, aspects as well that you think would be like rather interesting to highlight um, in light of the Book of Mormon and how it should be read as history? Yeah, I mean. To kind of get to the bottom line of this whole thing, um, um, you know, again, going back to the idea of contention, which I think is um, uh, just fundamental to what Mormon is trying to tell us today. Um, and you know, I'm not, I'm not taking, I'm not trying to take a prophetic role in saying how we should apply this to these specific circumstances, but, but whatever, you know, however we want to apply it. Uh, my role, as I see it, is simply to point out how fundamental and, and essential the idea of, of contention among the Nephites was to what Mormon was trying to tell us as a historian and as a prophet, right? They, they go together. It's not one or the other or it's two th different things. He's, he is a prophetic historian, uh, but he's also writing, as I say, in this kind of sacral mentality that, that all that all blends together and not go into a lot of detail in the book to try to kind of explicate it. But um, the, um, let's see. Um, so I go into a number of themes that, um, that Mormon emphasizes, some of which, um, or a lot of which actually um, parallel closely the themes in the Old Testament, um, the Deuteronomic themes, um, so there are there are numerous themes uh, in the book of Deuteronomy which are also mirrored in the De so-called Deuteronomic history, which is the basically the books of uh, Joshua, Judges, First and Second Samuel, and First and Second Kings are often referred to as the Deuteronomic history because they emphasize a lot of these themes from the book of Deuteronomy, especially. Um, um, but, and, and so it looks, I can't prove this, but it certainly looks very suspicious that, that Nephi had at least a lot of the Deuteronomic history writings in, um, in, the, in the brass plates that, that Mormon then had access to. Um, and um, he was very familiar with a lot of these themes and incorporated them into his history um, and a lot of them have to do with the idea of covenant and, and uh, you know, remembering, remembering the, the blessings of the Lord and, um, and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, that, so I go into quite a bit of, of discussion of that, of those kinds of things. But the, 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 the core theme uh, I would say the two core themes of Mormon's record are one, the idea of the of the terrible social as and spiritual 
harm that uh, rebelling against God, you know, and and content not not just rebelling against God per se, but social contention, right? So um, uh, this is let me just point out um, what, what I find a very interesting little passage when um, when Christ appears to the Nephites in in third Nephi eleven. Um, I suddenly noticed a few years ago that the very first thing that he mentions, okay, in, I guess it's chapter 12, where he's, he's, you know, he's allowed the people to come and feel the male prints in his hands and so on. He's introduced himself. And then when he starts preaching to the people, teaching them, the very first thing that he mentions is the proper form of baptism. And you think, well, that's, you know, that's important. We, we believe that it's proper to have, it's important to have the proper authority and the proper form of baptism. But why is that the most important thing that he starts out with? Uh, but when you read it, and especially when you read it in the historical context of Mormon's record, you see that this is, this is something that is, that is, uh, that really stands out because what he's saying is not simply that, you know, the proper form of baptism is, is essential, but it's all about contention. So he says, um, he says, on this wise shall you baptize, and there shall be no disputations among you. And we haven't heard about any disputations among about the, the topic of baptism, but apparently there were. And then in verse 28, he says, there shall be no disputations among you as there have hitherto been. So there clearly was discussion on this topic, but also on lots of other topics. Uh, and he says, he says, neither shall there be disputations among you concerning the points of my doctrine as there have hitherto been. For verily I say unto you, he that hath the spirit of contention is not of me, but is of the devil. And so on. He can stirreth up the hearts of men to contend with anger one with another. Um, so if you put this into the historical context of Mormon's record, it, it's obvious that, you know, this contention has been a fundamental theme that Mormon is posing, but it's also something that, that Christ was very much aware of. And he says, this has to stop. This has to stop. And of course it does for 175 years in fourth Nephi. As we as we saw before, and and and, and Mormon is emphasizing it again and again, there's no contention, there's no contention, there's no contention among the people. Why does he say that? Because there was so much of it before the visit of Christ, and of course there was massive contention afterwards. And so, you know, I think that um, I could go into a lot more detail, but I, I won't. I won't take the time here to do that. Read the book. Um, but, um, you know, he, 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 he emphasizes this, that, you know, contention leads to war, it leads to bloodshed, it leads to destruction. Um, and it's, you know, I, when I, when I say this, I'm not, I'm not questioning that, that those things actually happened. I believe they did, but it's also a question of how Mormon is shaping his narrative to, as a historian, as a prophetic historian, to help us understand what can happen in our world today. Um, and again, he, it's not only the story of the Nephites, but it's the story of the Jaredites as well, that Mormon thought was so important to get to our attention. Um, and uh, um, yeah, I hope, you know, um, these are things that I, I'm, I'm sure readers and listeners are aware of, um, the idea of contention has been emphasized in the last couple of years in, in, in general conference, but um, part of what I wanted to do with this book was to just show how fundamental it is to to what Mormon is 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 getting at, um, both you know putting in its historical context in terms of the sacramentality, but also just simply as as as, as in a prophetic sense that it's something we need to pay close attention to when we read the Book of Mormon. Um.
No, thanks for that. I think that should uh, whet people's appetite for the uh, book. As I said, uh, it's Mormon's Record, um, the historical message of the Book of Mormon. As I said, there's a uh, link in the show notes for those who want to order a copy. <clears throat> but um, before we like, get me uh, just end things, like, are you working on any other projects at the moment uh, that may be of interest to um, the audience? Yeah, I definitely am um, working on... Uh, <laughs> I jump around a lot, but that's just the way I am. Um, my, um, the book I'm working on right now is, is basically a new look at the great apostasy. So I'm looking at, as a Roman historian, I'm looking at, uh, the idea of the apostasy, um, in historical terms. So we often, you know, discuss it in mostly theological terms, uh, about, you know, the loss of the gospel and so on. And, um, there've been a number of brief discussions. Uh, about about what the apostasy might have been, how it, you know, what what it actually consisted of. But I'm trying to look at it specifically, uh, focusing on the second century, so the, the post New Testament period, um, uh, and and looking carefully at what we what we have from, which is not a whole lot, of of early Christian sources after the New Testament in the second century. There's there's a certain number, but but not nearly as much as we would like to have. But, um, you know, looking at it in the context of what we know about the second century in the Roman Empire and not, not simply, I mean, I'm focusing on the idea of apostasy, but, um, but also looking at the pressures that these early Christians were, were laboring under, right? So ob the obvious one, of course, is the persecutions. So we'll get into that, but there were a lot more social um, pressures that, and intellectual pressures that they were under as well. Um, so basically, you know, to put it in a nutshell, it's basically the loss of the apostles, the the loss of of revelation, and then what what follows, you know. And and I think we have some very very interesting history uh, of, of people that that did the best that they could under under very difficult circumstances and um, some people have accused latter-day saints of kind of ignoring you know 1800 years or 1700 years of Christian history um, and, and and perhaps there's some there's some truth in that and I think we need to look more carefully at at our um, you know the the both the failures but also the successes of of these early saints. But it's going to be a number of years before that book comes out. Well, we'll definitely interview you when it comes out, but that should be fascinating. We need more um, discussions about like the early apostolic fathers and other stuff like that. So that should be interesting. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks again for your time. Really do appreciate it. As I said, um, there's a link in the show notes. So anyone, everyone should pick up a copy of the book. It's actually very good. It's also pretty chunky. So it looks very good on your library when you're finished with it. But, uh, uh, Greg, it is, uh, let, me just, let me just add that it apparently it, it is currently available on a Deseret Book website. I think it's available through the Religious Study Center at BYU <laughs> website. Uh, it's not it's available through Amazon, but it's not it's not um, it's available for for pre order. Um, rather, it's not so it's not actually available yet, even though somehow Robert got his hands on one. Um, before you did yeah. <laughs> um, and let me also name drop because um, um, Kent Jackson uh, wrote the preface to the book um, so he many of you will be familiar with his name um, but he uh, he wrote a very nice preface to the work so I had to had to bring that up <laughs> uh, it's all good he's done some very good work on um, Book of Mormon and uh, JST issues um, but yeah, uh, thanks again, for, Greg, for your time. And uh, everyone should sure. check out a copy of the book. It's very well good. And the same with your previous work. And I'm sure your forthcoming book on um, the great apostasy in second century Christianity will be like a very good uh, contribution to that field as well. So uh, thanks again for your time. Really do appreciate it. My pleasure.